Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. This is your chance, saints. I pray is a welcome you if you're joining us on the destiny broadcast it's great that you're watching the services from destiny why don't you drop us an email let us know what's going on in your life it's always good to hear from you and don't forget if you can ever make it to destiny church wakefield on a sunday morning it'd be great for you to be able to come and worship with us this morning we're going to hear a great message from our senior pastor pastor ian critchley and it's called making the most of your time and they're lessons from ecclesiastes let's welcome him as he comes this morning Thank you. Time. Sounds like time is coming from outer space right now, doesn't it? Time. What time is it? It's 10.51. Our lives are ru ruled by time. This morning the alarm clock went up early. Why? Because it was time to get up. Tomorrow morning your alarm clock will go off. And you, like me today, you'll have to get up on time to get to work on time, won't you? Okay, well, forget about work. because, Or you will get up on time to have your breakfast and a nice quiet day. Time, everything. You know, and if, if you're involved in any sort of business or management, you've already probably been on a course about time management. Um, time is important. Time is what... God invented by the sun coming up and the moon coming out and it's day with 24 hours and it's divided into days and to seasons. God is a time-keeping God. The Bible talks quite a lot about time and seasons. Sometimes we think life's just one big long journey. No, it's a journey that's split up into days, into weeks, into months, into seasons of our life. Uh, I've just entered a great season of my life. It's called youthful thinking. And uh, I refuse to say that I've, I'm only two years away from receiving my old age pension. According to some timeline, but as far as my own timeline is concerned, we're along. Time is important. I mean, it's like if you go to a barbecue and somebody's got a really nice juicy hamburger on the, on the grill. If you take it off before time... It's a raw, horrible mess. But if you leave it on there after time, you've got a charcoal lump. Time is important. How many people are wearing the time on their wrist? There you go. How many of you got time on your phone? How many of you know that you are spending time? Why do we use that phrase, spending time? The thing of it is we're spending time because time is costly. 
Oh, and by the way, it's one of those things you, you'll never get back again. And how you spend it is important. We mustn't, how many of you know this expression, waste time. The problem with wasted time is that it's time that brings to us no profit, no return. Time is important. Don't waste time. Spend time. You know, sometimes you, people will say, let's spend some time together. Well, when you spend time together, remembering that you're making an investment of your life during that time. So make it count. It's important that we understand about time. You know, you go to the doctor and they give you tablets and they say take them three times a day before food or after food. Why? Because the timing of how you take your medication is important. Paying bills, that's important, isn't it? If you don't pay your bills on time, what do you get? You know, sleep, it's important. My mother always used to tell me one hour before midnight is worth two hours after. Well, these days I don't even know what midnight is. You know, by nine o'clock, I'm ready for... How many of you are with me? Okay, yeah, all the, all the people, yeah. I mean, it, it's, time is in, important. Have I got your attention? We're on time. That took me three minutes. So we're now on 10.54. We're going to keep you up on the time. And if you're watching this from a broadcast from elsewhere, like in America or Africa, or, we're talking UK time, summertime. And now our government messes with our time because in a few weeks' time, our time is going to change. And we're going to fall back, spring forward. You, remember, you know all about that, don't you? I don't know how. Good, good job that our times, the Bible says, are in his hands, isn't it? Yeah? Uh, I, time is important. Okay, let's turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. And we said that we were going to look at time from Ecclesiastes today. So you know now that we're going to go directly to chapter 3 from Ecclesiastes. Now Ecclesiastes is one of those books that the authorship of the book is a little bit in question. Although most people would probably tell you that it is Solomon. And uh, it's written by somebody who refers to himself as being the teacher. Or in some um, translations it calls him the preacher. And it's a book about the need to have wisdom. It's a part of those collection of books in the middle of the Bible with Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that are very poetic. And chapter 3 is a poetic chapter. In fact, it's a whole bunch of verses that are in, called couplets, right? Rhyming type couplets. And we're going to read particularly, uh, focus on seven verses. Join those seven verses that are 28 statements. In those statements that are 14 positive statements and 14 negative statements. It's, it's, it's wonderfully crafted. If you'll, Sometimes we read the Bible and we just read it as a story, you know. But behind the story, there's incredible detail. Why? Because God's a genius. Hallelujah. He's, he is just a genius. The whole thing works together really, really, really well. So let's read this poem of couplets. Um, verse 1 is just a... An introduction, and then verse 2 comes into the poem. All right, chapter 3, verse 1. There is a, say the word with me, time. Start again, are you ready? There is a time for everything and a season. Say season with me. Season. There is a season for every activity. The word activity there, or in some translation, is the word purpose. And I want to use the word purpose because it helps us to understand the the meaning of that verse better than just activity because some, how many of you know you can be active without any purpose yeah you can be busy doing nothing going nowhere huh you've got your eyes open your legs are moving uh, somebody said it's like this the lights are on but nobody's at home so activity doesn't really cut the custard what we're talking about from the Hebrew word is purpose. So let's read that verse again. It says, there is a time for everything or every purpose and a season for every purpose under heaven. God is a God who's got purpose in his mind. When God created the heaven and heaven, oh, and by the way, I still, I believe in creation. I believe that God is the creator and the sustainer of all things. And when he did it, he did it on purpose. When Jesus came, he did it on purpose. Read through all the pages of the Old Testament, you'll see the purpose of God being worked out in the plot of the Old Testament. Then Jesus came, and he fulfilled the purpose of redeeming mankind. And then the rest of the New Testament is all about the church, basically, accepting their responsibility to live on 
purpose. And the purpose now is to see this gospel preached in the whole earth. And then the end will come. Jesus is going to come again. And the earth that is already the Lord's is actually going to... Oh, I love the purpose. It says that the people are going to stream to it. And God is going to raise the church like the mountain of the Lord. Why? Because of God's purpose in His mind. God is not haphazard. Sometimes we will get up and we don't have an agenda on our diary. And so many of our days are just full of diary, you know, point, 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 point. And then occasionally you'll get one of those wonderful days and we'll say to each other, me and my wife, what should we do today? And we'll say, oh, let's make it up as we go along. God is not making it up as he goes along as far as you're concerned. He's got a plan and he's got a purpose. The, the will of God is being enfolded in your life. It's called purpose. There is a time for everything and a season for every purpose or activity under heaven. And then it goes into these seven verses, 28 statements, 14 negative, 14 positive statements. And we're just going to read through them. And you've got to remember this is poetry. All right, so when you read a verse, there's a time to kill. Wives, that is not your cue to go home and say to your husband, I'll kill you because the Bible says I can. It, it's, it's more complicated than that and it's poetry. Is that okay? You can't even say it of your son, of your boss tomorrow, okay, or of your pastor ever. All right, now let's read these, these, uh, these couplets in this verse. It says there's a time to be, to be born and a time to die. Uh, how many of you organized your birthday the day you were born? No, none of you did. That's out of your hands. How many of you are going to organize your death day? No, it's out of your hands. There are some things that are only in God's hands. And that's why he starts with that. It's time to be born, a time to die. And then it goes up, time to plant and a time to uproot. Then it goes and says a time to kill. Remember that it's a bit more complicated than what it just looks like. And a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them. You think like, well, what is all that about? Well, particularly in, in, in the Jewish land where the, 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 the ground isn't just like Yorkshire soil. You know, it's, it's very hardy, and there's a lot of rocks there, and, you know, if you really wanted to get your neighbor because he got his ground doing really well, and he was doing very well in his allotment, all you've got to do is come along at night and throw a few stones into it, and he's got problems. There's time to scatter stones, and there's a, then there's a time also to gather stones. And when you gather stones, what did you do? You build a wall with them. All it's saying is it's a practical poem that they would have understood in their day. And then it says a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up. You know, sometimes when we lose something at home, you know, like my wife loses her car keys. Of course, I've never done it, so I don't really know how that feels. Okay, come on. How many of you have lost your car keys? And and your house is really organized and you always put them there and there's a search, search, search going on and how is it that you find them when you stop searching? Yeah, once you decide to, there's a time to search and there's a time, the Bible says here, uh, to, to, to stop it and, uh, and the, it says a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent Okay, there's one that you can use on your wives, guys. In the same way as do not kill. It's more complicated than that. So don't you start saying to your wife tonight when she's talking, 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 talking. The Bible says be silent, woman. Right? It just, just doesn't work, all right? You're going to be having an appointment with your pastor next week if, they start, if you try saying that. But there is a time. The Bible says that our tongue, you know, it, it's talky, talky, talky all the time. And it's a, it's a hard member to to control, but we've just got to learn how sometimes, even with God, to say, God, I'm going to trust you, and I'm not going to moan at you, and I'm not going to complain at you, that just sometimes I'm just going to keep, just keep quiet about some things. Time to, um, to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. Okay, it's a bit more complicated than that. Don't go and say, yeah, well, that person across the other side of the church, I hated them, I always did hate them, and now I've got a Bible verse that says I can hate them. No, there are things to hate. Not people, things to hate. I hate sin. I hate 
ruin. I hate brokenness. I hate waste. I hate seeing somebody who really once ran really well for God and then they fell in some sort of sin and now they're down there. And I hate what happened to them. I hate the fact that some of the friends that I grew up with who gave their lives and went into the ministry and these days they're no longer serving the Lord. I, I hate that. You understand? In my heart, I, I'm, I'm grieved by that. I think, no, that there are things to, you know, if, if you ever hear of domestic violence, it's okay to hate that. If you ever hear of, you know, sexual improper relationships that are going, you, you can hate that because there are things that we hate, but we, we still love the people, don't we? And, and it says there is a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And what does the work again? So that's the poem altogether. Then verse 9 fills in a little bit more thoughts. He says, what does the work again from his toil? I've seen the burden that God has laid on them. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has made everything beautiful. That's his purpose, okay? God, is, God made you. He made your life. He made your situation and beautiful in its time. Right? Time is important there. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Oh my, let me tell you something. You think your life is all about now, and then you project it forward, and you think, well, the Bible says three score years and ten, that equals 70 in, in, New, in King James Version, but now we're all living a little bit longer, so we're probably like into 80. Then I look around our congregation, and I see quite a few people who are 82, 3, 4, even into their 90s, and I think, oh, I've, I, I've, I'm young. I've still got another 30 years to go. But it's not all about life here now because God has put something inside our hearts called eternity. The eternity that's in our heart is that we know that this isn't what it's all about. We know that life isn't, you know, when, when I die and, and that's the end of it, it isn't the end of it because eternity is in my heart. And I've got a sense that actually my life continues, but also what I do in life continues when I've exited this life and stepped in to live the rest of my eternity. That is what it's all about when we think about legacy, when we think about leaving an impression of life, making sure that our life counts for something. If we're going to spend time on your life, spend time on something that is going to last and outlast your years and has got a sense of eternity in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there's no greater joy for me to find out and meet people who maybe years and years and years ago in the earlier part of my ministry came and gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And I find out 20, 30, 40 years later that they're still living for Jesus Christ. And it gives me great joy. Some, somebody from our church went on holiday a little while ago to an, an overseas country and they were sat in a campsite talking to somebody who happened to come from Britain and they started to talk about their church and they started to mention a name and said, Ian Critchley, I know him. He used to be my pastor 35 years ago. And I think like, hey, come on. Why? Because there's a sense of eternity in our hearts. This is not what it is all about. And how you spend time now, the Bible says... In your time now, don't just store up treasure for yourself for the now. Store up treasure for yourself in heaven where, King James Version again, neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. And if you can understand what that is, you're a better man than me. Well, we understand it, don't we? You know, this life gives you its reward, but there is a reward that we've got our eye on that actually the only... Eternity in your heart only gives you that understanding of, of, of what it's going to be for them. Let's make a difference now. Spend your time on doing something fruitful. Spend your time on doing something worthwhile. Spend your time that is not only just a blessing for life, but has got a consequence as far as eternity is concerned. Because God has put into the heart of man, according to this, eternity in our hearts. And then it carries on, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. In other words, it's a little bit too hard for us to really understand, but really just make sure that you're doing something worthwhile with your life. Verse 12, I know that there is nothing better for men. <laughs> men. You see, when men are not like this, they're, they're, they're of all people most miserable, aren't they? But actually, he's not talking about male men. He's talking about people. I know that there is nothing better for men and women than to be happy and to do good while they live. 
that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I love that verse. You know what it basically means? God wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to have fun. He wants you to enjoy. Yes, He wants you to be focused on the purpose. He wants you to have a nose to the grindstone, like we say. He wants you to fulfill your purpose. But as you're living your life, He wants you to have fun. He wants you to enjoy young people. God wants you to have fun and enjoy your life. He doesn't want you to mess around with stuff that's going to ruin you. He doesn't want you to mess around with drugs, mess around with drink, mess around with illicit sexual relationships. That's just going to mess you up. God wants you to enjoy life. When you get a young family, He doesn't want you to just be, you know, be insecure. He wants you to enjoy your family and enjoy watching your kids come up. And when you get to the ripe old age of 40 or 50 or 60 or 70, He still wants you to enjoy life. He still wants you to be able to say, yeah, here's my life and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy each of the seasons of my life. Whichever season of life you're in right now, God did not intend for you to just think the whole thing is irksome. I mean, he even talks, Solomon talks in Ecclesiastes about this vain, rubbish useless, worthwhile life. You read the first bits of it. You know, meaningless life, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. It's meaningless until you understand purpose. It's meaningless until you understand eternity. It's meaningless until you, under, until you put God right at the center of it. Because, you know, we, 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 we do these things, you know, and it's all about me. It's meaningless. We do these things. I, I've done it. I got really angry sometimes in life about something that in the end, when you look back, it was meaningless. The things that we spend our time doing for God, those are the, those are the important things that we, that we need to be doing. You know, the, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 31, verse 15, that our times are in His hands. God has got a timeline as far as you're concerned. He's, like I said earlier, He's not making it up. He's got a timeline for you. You know, when you're looking at a project, I remember when we did this last project a couple of years ago here on the building, and the architects, we discussed with them, and they produced this elaborate timeline. You do this, and then you do that, and that leads to that. And if you do that there, then you're going to mess it all up. You know, you don't want the plasterers coming in before the electricians, and you don't want the electricians in before the bricklayers. You, it, it, the whole thing has got some sort of order. It's got a purpose in. You don't start putting the roof on until you've got the walls up. Everything has is, is got an order. to God's just the same. He's got an order. His times are in your hands and wherever you are on in your timeline right, timeline right now, I want to tell you something. God is not in confusion about your timeline. Now, it is true, of course, that you can delay that timeline. And that's what Solomon's talking about in, when he wrote Ecclesiastes, if it was him. That's what Ecclesiastes is talking about anyhow. It's saying, listen, you need a wisdom to know how to live your life in timeline, in sync, to mesh with, to be in the right time and at the right, with the right people for the right purpose. We've, you've got to actually have some wisdom in life to know. You know, there's been definitely some times in my life that I've wasted time. There's been times when I, you know, I didn't have the right attitude, didn't have the right response, didn't have the right faith. You know, I was just, I was so ticked off about something that I spent sometimes weeks, even months, uh, and the, the timeline got stopped. It got put on pause Why Ian got himself sorted out. What a waste of time. The good thing is I found out that God is able to restore the time and that he's able to, the Bible talks about there's a verse in the Bible that he's able to restore to us the years that the locusts have, I mean that the picture of this is, oh no, I've wasted it. I was having a conversation with one of our elders the other day and I was saying, oh Lord, why didn't all of this that we're experiencing right now come when I was 40? You know, it would have been, I'd have loved it so. You know, I, get, I look at some of our younger staff and our younger pastors, and I think, like, it's so good for you. I really wish this had all been happening for me when I was your age, right? Well, some of that has got to do with, you know, I was slow on my timeline, and it maybe could have happened a bit quicker. And some of that has got just to do with the fact that God's got his timeline, and it's got actually nothing to do with me. And this is God's time, amen? It's God's time for, for you. It's talk about... Season. Even Jesus, do you remember in Jesus in the gospel, he says, my time has not yet come. Jesus wanted to go and do some stuff, and he says, no, no, I can't, I can't, because the, the clock is ticking, and my time 
And if that is true of Jesus, that actually he was restricted from being able to do something because his time has not come, then I've got to look back in my life and so have you and say, you know, we're on time. Let's make sure we're on time. And actually God has got a, a plan for us. You know, timing can be delayed and timing can be hastened. I, I believe that as we walk in faith, and I believe that as you and as we as a church will walk in faith and we'll be ready responders. Since the children of Israel are, are an interesting example to me, the children of Israel went on a journey from Egypt to the promised land that should have taken them a very short time, and they spent 40 years. You know, sometimes I really believe in the sovereignty of God. I, I'm, t I'm a total sovereignist when it comes to the fact that God is God and God will do what God will do. But in, in, I'm totally for that. But when I look at the children of Israel, I think like, I don't believe that God would have wanted them to be in the wilderness for 40 years. And the Bible doesn't support that either. It was because of their unbelief and it was because of the way that they responded that they ended up going around and around the wilderness for 40 years before they came in. And I think like, oh Lord, help me to never ever be in a place where I delay getting into the promised land. Amen. God's got a promised land. I believe that God was saying that prophetically, prophetically to somebody earlier in the service. That your time of struggle, the night time that you've been in, is, is coming to an end. Now, now, don't ask yourself the question, you know, was that too long, too, too short, too early? God's got a plan for you to come into your promised land. But don't delay it. Let's be in faith. Because I believe that your time has come. I remember as a church and our testimony and I always want to share a couple of testimonies just, just over these next couple of minutes. Our testimony is a church, and lots of you have only joined us in the last few years. But if in October, we're going to celebrate 10 years of being in this building. Hallelujah. We're going to have a party. 10 years. That's, that's a, it's a real milestone, isn't it? It's 10 years and two years since we did all the development. So we're still in it. But it's 10 years since we came here. When we came here with about 80 people, something like that, 10 years ago, if you take the timeline and go back before then for the previous, I don't know, eight years or something like that, well, we did everything we knew how to push the timeline. I just remember standing up in the various church buildings that we rented and all the buildings we were renting on Sunday afternoons and standing up there and trying to preach out like there were 200 people there. And for me, the idea of 200 people in a meeting was like the biggest dream in the whole world. And I'd stand up and look at the people that were still left after the children and all the Sunday school teachers had gone and there were maybe like 40 or 50 people there. And I would, in my mind, I'd preach out at 200 and really go and it's like, oh Lord, when and if is this ever going to happen? And we did evangelism, and we did outreach, and we did special services, and all sorts of things. Huh? Nothing happened. Nothing happened, but God had a timeline. There's a lady sat here this morning that me and Rachel were going out and doing some leafleting, and we were putting flyers through doors like this, through doors. And we did all these doors, and we did them, and we did them, and we did them, and we did them. We thought, next Sunday we're going to see a real harvest, and next Sunday how many new people came? None. And I thought, well, if they must have been busy this Sunday, they'll come next Sunday. How many people came the following Sunday? None. And it didn't matter what we did. Some of you were there in those days. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't budget. The timeline just wasn't moving. It wasn't our time. But it was important in those times that we sowed. Because you sow in one season and you reap in another season. Amen. That's why it's important to sow in every season. Then you'll reap in every season. And then six months later than that, I think I was about the timing. She sat here this morning, so she'll tell me if I didn't get the story exactly right. But it's something like this. Six months later, a lady walked into our, into our church, and she came. She said, I've been wanting to come for quite a long time and pulled out of her purse a leaflet that she'd received through her door six months previously. And she said, I've been wanting to come for a long time. And here I am and pulled out that leaflet. Her name is Jenny Cook. And we're glad that you're here. Yeah, we're glad that you're here. See, sometimes when you're on your journey, you don't know what God is doing behind the scenes. Now, it would have been an encouragement to me, sweetheart, if you'd have responded earlier. You know, if, if, you'd, have, if you'd have come the next Sunday, 
I'd have gone, yes, it had got me out leafleting the week after. As it was, I didn't go out leafleting the week after because I thought it's no good because nothing happens. But the Bible says if you cast your bread on the waters, it shall return to you after many days. God's got a timeline coming in. And the testament of our church is that we, we, we came into this place and then the time came. I don't know why it was that time. I, don't, I remember the morning that we found out about this building. I made a phone call to a property developer and... And the guy said, what have you heard? And I said, I haven't heard anything. What should I have heard? And he said, you better get down to the office. And Alan, you were still at work by then. So Graham, I came and we came into that far corner. And, and we walked into this building. I squeezed him by the arm. And I said, this is it. You know, I mean, we'd, been, we'd had a prophecy 10 years before that that God had got a building for us. Talk about timing, timeline. When Keith Hazel sent us a prophet, he said, I've got a building for you. It's, it's an old sanatorium, he said. That's pretty clear. It's got two, it's got brown doors. We're never going to paint these doors white, okay, guys? Because this is what he saw in his prophecy. He said, on the inside, it looks fabulous and not so good on the outside, although we've changed that by now, haven't we? And then he talked about somebody who stood against us, and we look back on the story. I haven't got time for it right now, but I, I look back. Ten years later... It was fulfilled. Why? Because timing was going on. Timing. God had not forgotten me. Hallelujah. He'd not forgotten our church. And our time came. And the church, you know, from that time till this time, including to today, we've never had one Sunday without first time visitors. People who took their time to come in to see us on a Sunday. Thank God many of those people then decided that, that destiny is where they're going to plant their feet. They're going to spend their time. They're going to invest their lives. They're going to invest their time to being with us as a family to go and say, come on, let kingdom come and let the will of God be done. It, it's important how you spend your time. And I want to say to you, hundreds of you, thank you so much for giving your time to come and spend, invest your life with us on fulfilling the purpose for under heaven, everything's got a purpose and it's got a time. And this became, these last years have become our, our time. And our time is no, nowhere near finished yet. There's so much more to come. And, and I'm grateful during that whole period of time, I personally came to a, a time when it's like, oh Lord, you know, and things started to happen around the nations of the world. And the family of churches that now is known as Destiny Connections International all started to happen. You know, 20 years ago, I... I'd only ever been on a holiday somewhere. And the prophet said, I see the red dust of Africa on your feet. And I thought, that's strange. I don't. I've never seen. I didn't even know that Malawi, for instance, had red soil. You know, I thought, well, all the soil in Britain's brown mostly, isn't it? So I bought a pair of brand new white trainers to go to Malawi in. And I'm walking around Malawi. And, they, and then after a couple of days there, I look at these new Nike trainers and right about two inches up here is red. It never ever did come out. Lots of you are from Africa. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, red. And I looked down at my feet and I said, my time has come. The red dust of Africa is on my feet. And now you, 20 years later, there are churches out there in, in Malawi and in, in Congo now. Hallelujah. And in India and in Poland and the Czech Republic. And, and you look at 800 or so churches that are connected to the to the mother of Destiny Church, Wakefield, and you think like, hallelujah, our time came. You know, I have great joy seeing Pastor Joshua here from Destiny Nottingham, and you think like, Lord, how did this ever happen? Because God has got a timeline, because God has got a plan. Everything is on purpose. Some of you, you walked in here this morning, I want to tell you, you made the decision to come here, but God had a purpose for your coming. You thought, oh, let's, let's go and see what destiny is like. Well, there's more going on than maybe than what you know. For some of you, God's got a plan. He's got a purpose because you're going to be significant in our future and ours in your future because God has got a plan. He's made everything beautiful in his own time. See, how's that all going to happen? Well, going back to our testimony, we had to learn how to do something in the downtime. You know the, the fallow season, the winter season? We talk about the winter of life. See, I, I, this is a, a personal confession for me. The very People say, oh, I love autumn. So beautiful. 
I say, yeah, it is, but the days are getting shorter. And people say, oh, I just love winter, you know, the snow. And, and I think, no, the days are getting shorter. You know, I can't wait for December the 21st and the equinox in, in December. When I, I, I say to her, there's no, this is exactly like it is. Two days after that, I'll say, today's longer. And I'll say it every day, every day, every day. It's getting longer. One minute in the morning, one minute. I mean, we're right now, it's getting shorter. One minute and one minute at the beginning. And I, and I don't, you know, I don't do that very easily, but I do also know that God needs to, for the earth and for us, have seasons. The winter season is very important for our crop development and for the fruitfulness of our crops in the next season. It's very important. And it's been important for me in my life to go through some of those seasons of life, seasons where I had to struggle, seasons where, you know, not everything that I touched just happened to happen. The season for us at church during all those years, man, I wanted to quit. These elders will tell you again and again, I kept saying, I'm obviously just not the right chap because if I was the right pastor with them, we'd have been merged into our season. And I kept reading other book, books about other guys who come into their season just like that. I thought, what's wrong with me? Rachel one time was invited to go and preach at a quite prosperous, growing church in, in Britain one Sunday morning. They invited her, not me. That ticked me off to begin with. And then we met for lunch at the end of the morning, and I said, okay, tell me about it. She said, oh, it was great. Oh, yeah. You know, I was really not happy, right? And I said, how many were there? And she said, oh, it was probably about 500. How did you do? So it was about 50. See, and I was not happy, really not happy. I said, so what was their secret? What, why, why are they doing so well and we're not? And she said, oh, sweetheart, she said, uh, they're doing nothing better than we are. In fact, we're doing some things better than they are. But they just carried on doing what they were doing and their day came. I felt spoken to by the Lord <laughs> and my wife. And when God and your wife agree, boys, you, you, listen, guys, you just need to quit and just do it, all right? <laughs> There's a lot of nudging going on here right now. And, and when God and my wife joined up, you know, with agreement, something really starts to happen. I said, okay, I'm just going to carry on. And I studied hard, and I prayed hard, and I visited hard, and I, I just kept doing it, and kept doing it, and kept doing it. And thank you to all those of you that were part of that journey. You were just so wonderful. You, you just kept encouraging us, and you kept coming, and you kept tithing, and you kept giving, and you kept coming to the prayer meeting, and you kept coming, and you kept coming, and you kept coming, and you kept coming, and you kept coming. And you kept coming. Nothing happened. Until that time, and the time came. We're going to celebrate it in October. That time came, and we walked in here, and we went, wow. And then I kept saying, but it's, it's, it would seat a 1,000 people. That's what it used to be as a Victorian stage from here down. And I'm thinking, like, 80 people in here. It's going to look like a barn. And you all came in deck chairs, and we had about four rows of deck chairs around here with wood on the floor, and you couldn't hear because the echo was so big in the building. Then I had another worry, Lord, you've given us a building right now, but we've still only got 80 people. Why have you given me a building that seats a thousand when there's only 80 of us? You have to learn about God's timeline. Everything's got a purpose. Everything has got a time on it. And I want to tell you something. Your time is coming. Your time is now. There's a time. God's, God's clock is... Oh, my. And, and, and you, many of you know the rest of the story, how God just opened doors and opened doors and opened doors and opened doors. And not only for here, for the whole lot of the, the family of Destiny Connections that's around the world. And we look back and we say, hey, Ian, you did a good job. Because I can't do that. I did give it everything I got. But I can only look back and say, the very best that I did didn't do it, but God, you did it. And the Bible has the verse. When we look back, we say this, you are the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Hallelujah. Yeah, of course, we can progress or hinder the working out of God. You can. I believe that being here today is progressing your timeline. 
I believe that you being part of a good church like this, but being by the side of good people like all the rest of these people, you know, is, is part of your timeline being written and increasing. You, I don't believe that God wants us to be in the wilderness for too long. Amen. I, I just... I keep meeting Christians who are in the wilderness, you know, they, they left this church because of that problem, they went to this one, they left that one because of the problem, and now they don't really, somebody said to me only a couple of weeks ago, I don't go to any church because I've never found a church that I like. I think, well, you've probably never found a church that likes you either. <laughs> but the key is, find a place. I love that song where it says, I found where I belong. <laughs> And in this house, I will grow because God's got a timeline for you. Your time has come. You're not always going to be in the shadows. Rachel and myself were at a, a meeting. In fact, it happened two times in two totally separate different places many years ago now. And a, a prophet got hold of me and he started yanking my hand up high in the air. Some of you guys were there. And he said, your time is coming. I'm going to lift you up. And he was straining my arm. And I was thinking, that was at a time when nothing was happening. And then he said to me, you need to make a decision. That was at a time when I was making no decision. You know what it's like when you've made a few decisions and they went wrong? The best way to not do anything wrong is to make no decision. So I spent several years saying, let's pray about it. And the prophet knew about it, not that, he didn't, he didn't know my life story at all. And, and in front of him, there was maybe 200 people in this meeting, it was really embarrassing. He started to say to me, it's time for you to make a, a decision. Then he looked at me and he says, make a decision, even if it's a bad one. You need to make a decision. I said, I'm not going to make a bad decision. My reputation is on the line. Timeline. Well, my reputation was already on the line because nothing was happening. So the next day I went out and I bought a new car. Well, it wasn't new, second hand. And Rachel says, why are you doing that? I said, I'm making a decision. She said, it might, <laughs> might be a bad decision, but I'm making a, a decision. And I, it was like, I ended up paying for it for the next three years, right, on my timeline. But, but I felt good that I'd made the decision. It was all part of trying to get me out of this thing of being so defensive that you actually don't walk by faith. God's got a timeline. Hallelujah. God's got a timeline working right now. The clock is ticking even right now. We're on 11.30 now, so I'm going to quit. That means I've preached for 19 minutes. Oh no, my sums are a bit wrong on that, but you can't do maths when you're standing up preaching to such great people as you. I just feel like I've preached for about five. You see, that's what it feels like to me, but I just want to say this to you finally. For every season, for every situation, there's a time as far as God's purpose are concerned for your life. You'll meet the right lady at the right time. You'll meet the right man at the right time. You'll have children at the right time. You'll get promotion at the right time. It is your time to seek the Lord today. You'll make the decision to be in the right church at the right time with the right people at the right time. You know, and there's a time for this and a time for that and a time for this and a time for that. Do you remember 28 statements? 14 good, 14 bad. Time to be born, a time to die, a time to raise up, a time to pull down, a time, a time, a time. Just make sure that you're on time and that you spend your time wisely. The book of Ecclesiastes is written to help us to be wise about making choices. Time is the most valuable thing that you can ever give. It is time to seek the Lord. Spend time in God's presence. Spend time reading the Word. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in fellowship. Spend time in church. Spend time in serving. Do those things that are sowing time. Because if you'll sow time, you're going to reach a harvest that's going to come back to you and you've got a sense of eternity in your hearts. Hallelujah. And you'll look back in your life and you'll say... I don't regret the time that I spent putting God first. And by the way, when you put God first, he's going to tell you, now let's concentrate on your marriage. 
and you're going to spend time with your sweetheart, and you're never going to regret that time. And then when you get children, he's going to say, now spend time being a good father or a good mother, and you're going to spend time with your children, and when they're grown up, because when you've trained a child in the ways of the Lord, and they're old and they won't depart from it, you'll look back and say, I don't regret having spent time training my children. You, know, I mean, you won't regret having spent time playing football, spend time going to the beach, spend time, spend time doing those things. You'll never... Never regret it. We had an awesome prayer meeting here on Wednesday night, and it was a, a, a fantastic. I don't regret having spent the time to be with you to seek God together for the blessing of the Lord on our lives and on our church. There's other things that I've done, and I think, what a waste of time. So don't waste your time. If you don't know Jesus, it's time for you to get to know him. The Ethiopian eunuch was in a, in a journey. Philip the evangelist came and talked to him. He said, I want to get baptized. And he says, what does stop you now? This is the time. There's water there. Some of you need to make a decision. It's time for you to get baptized. Some of you need to... We've got baptism coming up on the 25th of this month. It's time. Your time's up. Time to make the decision to go on put your roots down. Maybe you need to make a, a moment of dedication to God to, today and say, I'm not just going to attend this church any longer. I'm going to put my roots down. I'm, I'm going to give my life on, on time for the, for the glory of Jesus Christ. And then, by the way, when you're doing all of those serious stuff, have fun. Because Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing better for man than to enjoy life and to eat and drink and have fun. And every time you go to bed in the evening with a smile on your face saying, that was a day well spent. You spent your time. You can never spend it again. So don't put off until tomorrow what you can do today. Because God gives you enough for today. Go and do something good with your time today. But Jesus, his time came. And then his time came. He was nailed to a cross. Three days later, his time came. And up from the grave, he arose. And then his time came. He ascended into heaven. Then the time came. And he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us, to go and fulfill his purpose. Because there's a time coming when a trumpet will sound and Jesus is going to come again. Oh, I'm going to, I'm a, a impatient person in many ways. So I'm saying, Lord, give me patience. Now, let's go and get on with fulfilling all that God's got to do, given us to do in our lifetime. Lifetime. Oh, the Lord bless you. You're just the best. May God bless every one of you as you spend time with the Lord and spend time serving in this week. Don't waste your time. It's just not worth it. You only get one chance at this life. The Lord bless you. We love you. Thank you very much.